Welcome to Progress in San Diego, Ordinary People Doing Extraordinary Things. I'm your host, Walter Davis, and welcome to our show. We try to focus on issues that deal with human rights, social justice, and the environment uh, during our show. And tonight I have the pleasure to have a Dr. Imad Tadros and Eileen Lasher, and you are from the California Coalition for Families and Children, correct? Correct. Yes. Now, tell me a little bit about that. Tell me a little bit about uh, the goals and the mission of California uh, Coalition for Children and Families. Uh, this coalition was accidentally formed, actually. We were not planning. It came out from a lawsuit that was filed in a Superior Court in San Diego in, in 2008. And parents have become aware of the lawsuit, and they started to connect uh, with me and with other people. And we got together, and we found that we're sharing the same problem. We're in the same boat, which is basically violation of the rules of court, and that these parents were basically victims. So we decided intelligently to go ahead and connect together and form our group, and here we are. Because in unity, you have much more power, correct? Absolutely. Great. And, and Aline, Tell me something about you. Why are you involved with this? Um, I'm a family law litigant, and um, I've been in family court for 16 years, and I feel that I've been held hostage. But what I'm realizing is it's not just the family law litigants that are being financially harmed by this. The taxpayers are actually being harmed. Their tax dollars are being misused to basically line the pockets of a certain group of attorneys that are working in collusion with court-appointed minors councils and court-appointed evaluators, and there's a small group of them, and they get assigned to these high-conflict cases that litigate for anywhere from 10 to 15 years, and it's essentially kids for cash, but again, the taxpayers need to understand that they're actually footing the bill as well, and that's my point of view is it's important to let them know that they're being harmed as well. What are taxpayers paying? It's difficult to find the money trail, but essentially the court is by definition a financial institution because it's created by public funding. And the county of San Diego gets money and they place it in a coffer and it's, it comes from the state and federal funding and tax dollars. And in, from this coffer, which is held in the county council, they pay this group of, it's, it's like an organized crime group operating <coughs> within family court. They submit bills. I've tried to get the accounting from the county council, specifically from Nathan Northrup in San Diego, and I received a letter that they don't even keep individually account, uh, accounting. Who is Nathan Northrup? He is the head of the county council. And essentially, these attorneys and evaluators simply submit a bill to the county for services never rendered, and the coffer pays them. And, and Dr. Tadros, what, what is your background, sir? What is your profession? I am a, a board-certified psychiatrist. I've uh, been in San Diego in private practice since 1993. So you, you have a certain level of expertise in terms of... of evaluating the validity of the Absolutely. evaluators. Yes, sir, I do. Um, I am pretty much qualified to do my job and also to evaluate uh, other people like uh, those so-called evaluators. And um, <clears throat> the, the story came to shock us because I am into the evaluating people and I find out that these people in the family court, um, Nobody knows if they were evaluated or not, at least the one that I had to deal with. He was totally b um, basically BSing the system and acting as if he has a diplomat, a real diplomat, and he did not have a real diplomat. He had a diplomat that's one of these 14 different boards that came out of uh, a house built in 1957, 2,500 square foot on 2750 East Sunshine, and called himself the American College of Forensic Examiners. And there are a whole bunch of articles about him under the credentialing con, under the uh, expertise to go by Mark Hansen, uh, an article written by Professor Carol Henderson, who's a professor of law. They all concluded that this was basically diploma mail. 
And, but it's very clever because the diploma looks very real, very misleading, and the public will obviously be intimidated and succumb to such thing. And in the meantime, the judges think that they, they have someone who is really qualified when in fact he's just buying false credentials. Okay, so what you're saying is that we have people that are evaluators in the family court system. They have fake diplomas. Absolutely. And, and they are being hired by the court system to make evaluations on people in family court. Yes, and they have no control as to how much you should uh, charge or for how long the evaluation would last. And not just that, that you can also repeat the evaluation and re-evaluate and, and then whatever the evaluators say, who people would think that he really has the diploma when in fact he doesn't, then the judge rubber stamps the recommendation. Mm -hmm. And when you read the recommendation very clearly, uh, the evaluator is recommending all kinds of jobs to be referred back to his cronies, whatever people that he's as as associating with. Whether they are um, legitimate or not, I don't know because I have not seen all their credentials. All I know is that I cannot trust him. And he is actually nicknamed to be the dean of all evaluators in our county. So he is the top. He gives the judges continuing legal education. He gives the attorneys continuing legal education. He educates the psychologists. Amazing, the man has false credentials. He does have a PhD. At least that's some, something that we could not uh, refute. But the other stuff that's the, the diplomat, that's amazing. It speaks heavily of the bad character of someone when he mm -hmm. goes ahead and he buys false credentials or buys this certification that all it takes is $350. So that's quite damaging. If, if we have people that have <coughs> false credentials in, in, in terms <coughs> of making evaluations on American families here in San Diego mm -hmm. County. That's and the taxpayers. And, and so they're taking advantage of the taxpayers. So there, there, there's at least two terrible things happening here. Mm -hmm. One, we have people that are not credentialed making uh, psychological evaluations on people and mm -hmm. In addition to that, the taxpayers are paying their bill, and there's a limited number. Is there are there not of these evaluators? There, right. there are only a certain number right. of these people. Only so a that, dozen of them. We call them the dirty dozen. There's a dozen of them. Yes. So other psychiatrists and or psychologists can't come into the picture. They to get try. Paid. They can try. But they're never chosen. It's only the people that are on the courts that will actually work in collusion with the attorneys to keep the litigation going and churn the cases. And it's similar to a tainted broker where you would invest money in stocks. The broker says, give me $5,000. I'm going to you know, make you more money. They take your money. They just get the commission, use up all your money, and say, thanks for playing. It's, it, it has tainted the cases, and essentially they're committing fraud. And we're not talking about $5,000, we're talking about $30,000 a pop for these evaluations. So this money coming from the taxpayers and the people that are going through family court is leaving a lot of them devastated financially and it's taking money away from the children that are supposed to be benefiting. Yes, sir. Yes. Well, the children are essentially used as, as cash. It's, it's kind of like a kids for cash. If you have children and you have a little bit of money, you are red flagged as a high conflict litigant that needs an evaluation. Now, if you don't have any money, uh, I guess the children, they don't need evaluations. It's only a certain group of kind of middle class people that uh, have jobs and maybe have a home that <coughs> these attorneys have done an asset search and they've de have turn determined that we have someone to milk and the other yeah, poor people, they don't, they don't get evaluations. Their cases St are resolved because there's no money, to, there's no money to be made. Statistics are a chill of yeah. and El Cajon, 
in Imperial right. County, you get much less evaluations yeah. by the private custody evaluator. There are two types. There are the ones that are county appointed and there are the ones that are private custody. The private custody are the ones mostly across the coast and uh, covering up Coronado, downtown La Jolla Del Mar, all the way up to Carlsbad. This is where you have the strip where you have the rich people. Yeah. And from there you have a lot of private custody evaluations done and somehow they give legitimacy, legitimacy to this. However, the other ones that are in El Cajon and Chula Vista, you really, they say that their files are very thin, <laughs> but the ones in downtown, you have boxes and boxes yeah. made. It's so clear because the one in downtown or the ones up, in, up north, they simply, the parents have the money, so they churning where the attorneys come in and the evaluators and it becomes a big operation where they keep making hearings and motions and, and re-evaluations and appoint all these people, all these services, the supervisor, the therapist, the urinification therapist, the evaluator, and then re-evaluate and the mediator and the minor counsel. You have a huge, big menu of services that are being done. Uh, and we're forced <coughs> to do. You're forced to do and you're forced to say, you have to go to this person now, we, we all know about the mafia. They, they have to tell people, you have to buy the cheese from this store. You have to go to fix your car at this garage. It is essentially an organized crime ring where you're told you have to go to this doctor, and then the doctor will say, well, now your children have to go to this therapist. So basically, all of their friends get to get all of the referrals, and it just becomes this cabal uh, that you can't get out of and it's by the time the children age out mm -hmm. when they're 18 there's no college funds left people have lost their homes mm -hmm. and um, nothing has been resolved so we're basically looking at middle class upper middle class and some wealthy people that are just yes. being taken to the cleaners right. by these evaluators or, or you might be both might be poor parents but if they had grandparents rich or have That's some assets true they become a target too. Right. Um, the, the, my major concern here is that uh, the, the, the state of California in general had suffered a lot of abuse by these evaluators. So starting in 2000, they created these California rules of the court where because some of the evaluators were fake, so they had to sign that they had a PhD and then a few years later, they said that's not even enough. We are going to actually have them write down that they have the qualifications as licensed to do what they are doing in the meantime right. mention what their expertise is and then later on they said no not just that that's not even enough we want them to do annual education hours this all became mandatory starting in 2005 every county in the state of california to my right. knowledge had followed the rules of court right but san diego now, they and that form yes. is signed under the penalty of perjury for a reason because it's very important to state your annual education hours your expertise and your degree, and you attest that under the penalty of perjury. These forms, the only county that did not fill out these forms were the county of San Diego starting from 2001 right. when they were strongly recommended, even when they became mandatory in 2005, none of mm -hmm. these forms were filled that were ever filled out until my attorney, right. the past city attorney, um, Mr. Mike Aguirre, past San Diego city attorney, called up the honorable um, judge uh, supervising Alfie. judge, Lorna Alsney and the court CEO, Mr. Michael Roddy, right. both of them, and they did respond and they did respond to our command that they were going to go ahead and implement it. They act to it a little bit uh, cool about it. They said, well, we'll do it in January, but when my attorney called up in September, they did implement the forms within three days. What concerns me the most is when I'm a doctor and I make a mistake, it's very important to admit it and do the right thing. And whoever got harmed from this is to make sure, mm -hmm. do the remedy, a right. remedial action, to make sure that no one is getting harmed as a result of that. What happens in this case is that it's amazing, and we have that in writing, that these evaluators, that specific evaluator, Stephen Doyne, apparently he had filled out the form backwards. Mm -hmm. he, it says, according to 5225K1B, that this form must be filled out 10 days before any work starts. So that means, if he mm -hmm. was f to, to fill out this form a year after the fact, that's just called lying under the penalty of perjury. And that's exactly what he had done. He lied under the penalty of perjury because mm -hmm. he filled out this form a year after the fact. But essentially, to not be in compliance with the California rules of the court and not have this form, 
there has been no bookkeeping on how much money has been made by these people. And working in a doctor's office or working anywhere, you fill out forms so you have to pay your taxes. You have to report to the administrative office of the court, which is Michael Roddy's job. These are the types of cases we have. This is how long it's been litigating. By not having these forms, this has allowed these people to essentially commit fraud and essentially steal money, and there's no bookkeeping. There's no paper trail. So that was the, the reason behind just not filling out the forms, and Channel 10 did an investigation, and Lorna Alexney, the supervising judge, said, yeah, we haven't been in compliance, so basically they've been stealing all of this money, there's no accounting, no payment to the IRS, and these are court personnel that are all allowing this to continue, and you have families that have been essentially financially gang <coughs> raped by this group of attorneys, evaluators and minors counsel who have a duty as officers of the court to adhere to the law. I adhere to the law. I follow the traffic signals. If I don't follow the law, if I'm not in compliance, I would get arrested and there would be a court proceeding. So we, there, there are a lot of officials that are not following the law, right. but I also understand that because of the diploma mill situation, that impedes any type of investigation because the investigators themselves have fake diplomas. Is that true? Well, that's what we need to figure that out because, yes, he does uh, sell the uh, one of the certifications called ABLE, A-B-L-E-E, -E, uh, which is the American Board of Law Enforcement Experts. Um, that one, actually, he sells it to, he, he's infiltrating the government and he's selling it to the FBI, the CIA, the police officers, the sheriffs, everybody. And if you go online, it's under Stephen Doyne Files on Angie Media, N-G-A-N-G-I-E Media. Right. Uh, Stephen Doyne Files, you'll see, you'll see all these boards. You can open them up and see them. They're all fake. Um, you can see here <coughs> uh, one for Homeland Security, one for Forensic Councils, one for Recorded Evidence one for American Board of Psychological Specialties, one for Forensic Accounting, Forensic Engineering, and one for Critical Incident Professionals, Forensic Social Workers, Intelligence, Law Enforcement Experts, Forensic Medicine, Forensic Nursing, Forensic Dentistry, Forensic, forensic Medicine. So if, in fact, this is true, and we have all of these officials who have fake diplomas, the American public should be outraged. If the American public knows about it. Right. And that's why I'm here tonight. Right. And I'd like to be held accountable. And when he, <coughs> I want to let the public know, if you go on the uh, www, the public court. Well, we need to make sure that we don't give out any websites right now. If anybody wants information um, about this, then they need to call the telephone number at the end of the broadcast, uh, come to my website, okay. and we'll make sure that you know how to get in touch with Dr. Tadros and access these documents. But in general, if you access that website, you will see that there is an amicus there, and it talks very clearly about uh, the, what was going on where the chairman of the bar is prompting the attorneys mm -hmm. to prompt the evaluators for them to commit perjury and lie under the penalty of perjury. And when they have old cases, they must never touch these old cases. This, this is the clear-cut indication and instruction that he should have given to all the attorneys to do. But he actually instructed them to go to old cases and make sure that these forms were filed appropriately. And, just and stick that's the exactly form in what happened. Like it's been there all along. That's so exactly what, what happened. What, what I heard you say is that these forms were supposed to be filled out before Correct. any Ten work days. was done. Correct. And so these things are being filled out after the fact and then stuck into the record. Exactly. Because as a result of and Dr. The Tadros does not know that. bringing this to, the, uh, to actually Channel 10, then it was uncovered that the forms weren't done. So we also have in our possession a letter from the president of the San Diego Bar Association telling the attorneys, okay, we've been Put caught. The record. Just fill out the form and stick it in the file. It's online. It's we have that put online on the site. And, and the appropriate response would be that the presiding judge or the supervising judge should say, wow, 
you know, there's been a lot of harm done. We need to contact all of the litigants that were adversely affected. We need to have an audit and figure out how much taxpayer money has been wasted and misused. How many uh, attorneys are involved? Let's have an investigation for these financial crimes. Instead, it's business as usual. The amicus also brings up the fact that the uh, chairman of the bar is telling all attorneys to basically cook the records and go to old records and cook them. Mm -hmm. And then the evaluator obviously acted on that one already and he filed out the form backwards. But what's, what's really important... Uh, what Before you go that, tell me what an amicus is. An amicus is basically when you enter the appeal level and you know of a case publicly and you know you, you have a full understanding of this case and you feel that you want to give your opinion to the appeal judges, what you do is you, you as a group of people, you cannot just send a letter. What you do is you get together, you say, we have studied this, or we have read this and understand it, and based upon this, we approve the amicus and they sign for it. And it's... Um, it's for the public good. This is <coughs> for something that is going to help the public to prevent further harm that something seriously wrong has gone on. So you, it's, it's a statement that you have discovered right. something seriously wrong and you're trying to limit further damage. Exactly. Right. This is for the public good. And also this is not just an isolated incident. We're trying to warn other people and we're trying to encourage the court that they need to follow the, the rules and protect the litigant and the public interest is supposed to be the primary role of the court, not the financial interest of the attorneys the evaluators and all of the people that are making money. There are also two um, 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 civil rights that were violated. One, the mm -hmm. Fifth Amendment, which is the due process. Right. We have a due process to the county of San Diego, to all the families and the kids. Mm -hmm. They have right. paid tens if not hundreds, possibly millions of dollars. We know one of our friends lost $2.3 million. Right. Okay, and they, they, as a result of illegal operation, conducting illegal 730 custody evaluations mm -hmm. done by in synchrony between the attorneys and evaluators and other psychologists in town functioning in different roles including therapist, mediator, uh, su supervisor, the whole nine yards. That due process where they are supposed to go back at least since they have become mandatory which is 2005, these forms should have been implemented then as mandatory. Where they all should have signed it. You should go back to then and acknowledge all the litigants that have gotten involved in this and let them know mm -hmm. what do you want to do. Mm -hmm. Are you in agreement to this or what do you want to do? Should we review the case? They're not doing anything. The 14th Amendment is also the equal protection under the law. We're the only county in the state of California that has been violated. Why? Because we are totally treated unequally in comparison to the rest of the, the, the state of California. And so the, there are concerns here. The, the public is not aware of this. I'm very concerned. Mm -hmm. I'm not a politician. I never know how to speak politics, uh, as far as I know. I, I, I only know medicine. But what I saw, uh, when you say broken families, there are also broken hearted people. Mm -hmm. I mean, they come through my practice line and I see them. Some of them become totally destroyed spiritually, mentally, everything. You take everything away from them. When you take a child, I mean, Think about it, each parent, Under when a false child... Under pretenses, when just a child, for money. When a child is taken away from you, how do you feel about it? I have not gone through this pain. I'm very lucky. My, the mother of my child and I will maintain a very amicable, respectful relationship. But I'm talking about other people. I'm talking about parents that I've seen, like herself and others. They are tormented. And that's my major concern. We're, we're coming down to the last part of this show. We're going to do a part two on this. But I'd like for you to, if you will, to elaborate further on that, because I understand that in your case, you had an amiable relationship with your spouse or ex-spouse. However, it, it appeared as though the officials wanted to turn families against each other. Is that something that happens? Even, yes, right. even the mom herself uh, agreed to that concept. Exactly. She, had, she felt that way, and she agreed to that effect. And she has been very kind about it and very understanding. And I'm very proud of her that she has come along. Yeah, we, we were not... We were not supposed to be in that system. Somehow, some way, somebody, you know, misinformed us. He owned a house her. is what, what brought him to that situation. Well, yeah. They do an asset search. If you have a house, they want that litigation to be continuing, so which is supposed to be over in six months, by even, the way. And, and, and yours lasted how long? 
It's still ongoing, 16 years, since 1995. 16 years, how much, yeah. how long did yours last? It, the way you pulled out of court immediately, within six months that I got involved with the public, I pulled out immediately, once I, I saw but, that. But some people have 11 year cases, 15 year, I, I remember hearing right. this before. High conflict yes. cases. Yeah, but I'm, I'm involved right. in it because I know exactly, I could see exactly what had happened in my case, how the facts were totally fabricated, how the, the data were given and the data were all totally omitted, and other facts that were twisted around, a whole bunch of things. The bottom line is, it, the focus was to destroy parents. And that's what people need to understand. The divorce rate annually is 60%. That's annual divorce rate. And so, so even when people are trying to get along, yeah. these officials will dissuade people right. from, from attempting right, to resolve right. their issues. So. The interesting thing is Dr. Tadros is a psychiatrist. He's very well educated. I think the big mistake they made was they, they really should have left this one alone. So if they're, well, tr if they're attempting to do this to a very well-educated, you know, let's face it, he's a psychiatrist. I was just, I, uh, I worked for the city of San Diego for 18 years, but you do have teachers that they're doing this to, but essentially he saw that it was a scam. <coughs> After the first meeting with Dr. Doyne, he knew something was wrong. Well, well let's, we're getting ready to end this part. We'll, we'll go more into this okay. in the second part of the interview. We have to begin to wrap this up. Okay. Uh, but I want the public to be aware uh, that as part of the coalition, we, we attempt to highlight stories that deal with human rights and social justice, and this mm -hmm. is certainly one of them. Mm -hmm. I'd like for you to get involved with the San Diego County Community Coalition and look at the website that's going to appear at the end of the broadcast and there's also going to be a number that you can call to get more information about the amicus brief and Dr. Tadros and mm -hmm. Eileen Lasher. And I, I ho right. hopefully you guys are going to put profiles up so that people can get in touch with you mm -hmm. on the coalition website. Uh, be aware that we are broadcasting live on the Internet right now on both Internet radio and television. And you can volunteer to become part of our crew here. We have an all-volunteer crew of wonderful people that come out uh, to volunteer to put our shows on the air. And we're looking to train additional people. Uh, we're citizen journalists, and we tell our story, and we try to get the stories out that the mainstream media does not cover here mm -hmm. uh, on progress in San Diego. So you can bring your story. You can come aboard and, and learn to be uh, videographers and learn to run your own television show uh, as we're doing now. We're hoping that we'll be able to get the California Coalition for Ch uh, Children and Families to develop their own television show and, and have a continuous series on uh, following up on the court cases and an amicus brief, please tune in next week at 5 o'clock to watch uh, our show with part two of uh, the interview with Dr. Tadros and Eileen Lasher. Uh, this is Walter Davis, and thank you very much for joining us. So we're going to.